I'm Staff Sergeant Holly Roberts Davis and thanks for joining us for Air Force TV's live coverage of the Air Force Association Air Warfare Symposium on DoD News. The theme for this year's conference is Innovate for Air Supremacy and it's a chance for commanders and senior enlisted leaders to meet up with industry partners and discuss the way ahead for the Air Force on a variety of topics like acquisition, modernization and the mission. For those who may not be familiar with the AFA conference, here's a quick look at some of the sights and sounds from the last get together of the Air Force's top leadership. My commitment, indeed our Air Force commitment going forward, is to continue to deliver global vigilance, global reach, and global power for America. We are extremely blessed in the Air Force because we have really impressive airmen. They are smart, they are dedicated, they are motivated. Airmen have always been the source of America's air power. As we look to the future, it is you who will carry the torch who will make us strategically agile. It is you, the airmen of the United States Air Force, who will continue to make the impossible possible. No problems are new, no challenges are new, no missions are new for us. It's just a new time. Circumstances are a little different, and we'll roll through these just like we rolled through the past ones. Most of you in this audience have led us through them, and we got a whole lot of people here in the front of this room who are gonna lead us through the challenges we're facing today. Uh, I don't worry about that because we need to be bold. We need to be a little fearless right now. We need to realize that we can spread our wings a little bit. And in fact, I believe as a service, we have to. Everything we do in our United States Air Force is going to be done on the backs of our Army. We're going to work hard. We always have. We live to that legacy every single day and we will into the future. It's what makes us who we are. And as we move forward, we're going to do some pretty significant things. We have to evolve the systems that have been in place a long time, that worked for quite some time, and did what we needed them to do, and really think about what they need to do in the future. We'll remain this world's greatest Air Force because we have the men and women just like you and the thousands from around the world doing exactly what their country needs them to do every single day, every moment of the day. So as you can see, the AFA conference is a forum for the Air Force's top leaders to share their vision for how the Air Force will continue to fly, fight and win in airspace and cyberspace. For this AFA, Air Force TV has a crew in Orlando, Florida to bring you live coverage of several of today's key presentations. Sergeant Kurtz, are you there? Hey, Sergeant Roberts Davis. Yes, we are here live in Orlando, Florida, and the Air Warfare Symposium is well underway. In fact, uh, as you can see behind me, people have just left the auditorium. They've already wrapped up the second panel discussion of the morning, and we're just standing by ready for the third one to kick off here in just a few minutes. That's going to be a panel on combat air forces, and it's scheduled to start at about 10 minutes past 10 this morning. You know, I had a chance yesterday to meet with Mr. Scott Van Cleef. He's the chairman of the board for the Air Force Association, and I had a chance to ask ask him about AFA and why he thinks it's so important for the Air Force to be a part of the Air Warfare Symposium. Here's some of what he had to say. The Air Force Association has a very broad mission. We're a nonprofit, independent, professional military and aerospace education association. And our mission basically is to support the Air Force and the idea of aerospace power. We do that in a number of ways. Uh, one of those is to advocate for the Air Force and for our airmen and their families. Uh, we also educate the public about the critical need for aerospace uh, power and for a technologically uh, superior work workforce. Uh, and finally, we support our airmen, our airmen's families, and we support aerospace education. Thank you for that report, Sergeant Kurtz. We'll be checking back in with you in just a minute. All right, sounds great, Sergeant Roberts Davis. We'll be standing by. All right, that was our very own Tech Sergeant Nicholas Kurtz. He's down in Orlando, and we'll be checking back with him throughout the day. But first, here's a rundown of what's coming up during Air Force TV's live coverage of the AFA conference on DOD News. 
First up, as Sergeant Kurtz mentioned in just a few minutes, we'll bring you a live look at the Combat Air Forces panel discussion featuring the commanders of Air Combat Command, Pacific Air Forces, U.S. Forces in Europe and Africa, and Global Strike Command. Later in the day, we'll have a live broadcast of Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Mark Welsh's Air Force update. Right after that, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, James Cody, will take the stage to deliver the enlisted perspective. In addition to our live DOD news coverage, we are carrying a live web stream of every panel discussion and presentation at this year's AFA. It's going on right now, and you can watch it all live on AF.mil. The next web exclusive live stream will begin today at 11.10 a.m. Eastern Time and feature a panel discussion on weapons and tactics. And don't worry if for some reason you can't stick around to catch every event as it happens because everything will be available on Air Force Blue Tube shortly after the end of the conference. Now we're going to send it back out to Sergeant Kurtz in Orlando who has some more information on what's coming up next. Sergeant Kurtz. Hey, thanks, Sergeant Roberts Davis. Yeah, we're just standing by right now, and in just a few minutes, the commander of Air Combat Command, General Hawk Carlisle, will take the stage, and he's going to be joined by USAF Commander General Frank Gorinch, PACAF Commander General Lori Robinson, and the commander of Global Strike Command, Lieutenant General Stephen Wilson, to discuss combat air forces. And you know, at the last AFA up in uh, Washington, D.C., outgoing Air Combat Command Commander General Mike Hostage spoke on a very similar topic, and he shared some of his insights uh, into leadership, basically what he learned about leading from the front and how that lends to a uh, commander's credibility as a combat commander. Here's what he had to say. It is through credibility that our military leaders can ensure that their troops and our civilian leaders place credence on what they say. This credibility is the basis for trust in our best military judgment. Budget cuts, force structures, reductions will ultimately make us a smaller force. But by leveraging the technology of today and the advancements of tomorrow, we can be more capable force with the ability to counter our most dangerous threats. In addition, we must retain the capacity and capability to deal with our most likely threats, sustaining the hard-earned skills and lessons learned during the most recent conflicts. Now on this panel, we expect the commanders to be talking about, well, combat air forces, and they'll be discussing strategic agility and the role they expect that to play in helping us build the air force that we need. Again, that's gonna start at about 1010, so just a few minutes, people are starting to filter in to the auditorium behind me now, and we will bring that to you live as it starts right here on DOD News. Back to you in the studio, Sergeant Roberts Davis. Thank you, Sergeant Kurtz. You know, when we're talking about combat air forces, our Airman Magazine team actually just got back from a trip to Alaska where they featured some of the intense training that our airmen go through to learn how to survive in extreme environments. Here's a short look of some of the incredible footage that they got at Cool School. If that aircraft goes down, you're in the middle of nowhere potentially. Uh, you're, not, you're not walking to a road, you, know, you don't see lights in the distance. It is you and the desolate areas in, in Alaska, and it can be pretty frightening. If you, if you can imagine being by yourself in the middle of nowhere, you just egressed from a fighter, and, and you're out there. You're floating to the earth, and all you see is thousands upon thousands of miles of nothingness, just trees and snow. Well, we at Arctic Survival, otherwise known as the Cool School, um, we got about eight instructors up here, we focus solely on how to take care of yourself in an Arctic environment. We get people from all, all walks of life in the military here in Alaska mainly, but we get people from outside as well uh, that come through the course because of where they work. Uh, the fact that they're flying a, a mission that is going to take them in potentially uh, Arctic-like conditions. Uh, therefore, they need to know how to take care of themselves in case uh, the worst case scenario happens. They have to bail out. Um, they, they crash, whatever it may be, uh, because quite frankly, it's a, a very harsh, difficult environment to, to have to deal with. Uh, when we... That was just a preview of some of the amazing content in the latest edition of Airman Magazine, which is available to download now for your mobile device. Just look for Airman Magazine in your app store. Well, the panel on combat air forces should be about ready to begin, so let's send it back out to Sergeant Kurtz live in Orlando. Sergeant Kurtz? 
Hey, thanks, Sergeant Roberts Davis. Yes, uh, people are starting to walk into the auditorium behind me, so we will bring you the start of that panel uh, just as soon as they take the stage. I just want to take a minute to remind everybody watching that uh, you can join the conversation. Follow the Air Force on Twitter. That's at US Air Force. They'll be live tweeting from several of the events throughout the day, so you can follow them on Twitter, and uh, they'll be here at the Air Warfare Symposium today and tomorrow. And like I said, you can also join the conversation. You can just use the hashtag AWS15. That's hashtag AWS15. Use that to leave your own comments and thoughts about all the events here at AFA and to search to see what everybody here at the conference is talking about on Twitter. Well, they should be starting the conference, uh, the next panel discussion on combat air forces here in just a few minutes. People are filtering in and I can hear them now. That's Mr. Scott Van Cleef up on stage. So we will send you now live into the auditorium for a panel on combat air forces here on DOD News. Uh, next topic of our, uh, our, our next panel, rather, is combat air forces. I know you're going to enjoy this one. I'll, enjoy, I'll introduce each of the panelists this morning, and then uh, following their opening remarks, I'll return to facilitate the question and answer session. Please uh, keep your cards and letters coming. Pass them to the uh, cadets in the center aisles, and we'll, we'll get them up here so that uh, I can ask those. Uh, copies of their bios are in your program. Our first panelist is the Commander of Air Combat Command, General Hawk Carlisle. Our next panelist is Commander of the United States Air Forces Europe, General Frank Gorenz. Next we have General Lori Robinson, Commander of Pacific Air Forces. And finally is Lieutenant General Stephen Wilson, Commander of Global Strike Command. <laughs> Panelists, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Scott. I really appreciate it. This is a great opportunity. What we'd really like to do, I think, is spend most time answering everyone's questions, uh, but we will all uh, make some opening comments here. Um, from my perspective, uh, obviously, I think, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Mike Hostage for what he did for Air Combat Command and, and setting me up for success in taking this position. Uh, tremendous commander of Air Combat Command and, and a brilliant guy, and so I'd, I'd publicly like to thank him for everything he did. Uh, priorities with respect to my ability to provide the, the warfighters uh, everything they can get and need uh, in a time of fiscal constraints, obviously, is a huge challenge for us. Um, we kind of established the, as everybody in the Air Force does, first and foremost, the uh, priority is to take care of our airmen and their families, these incredible young men and women that go out and do the job every day and, and uh, raise their right hand, swear an oath to our nation, and put themselves in harm's way. Um, as part of that, obviously, we got to continue to mentor them, we got to grow them, we have to equip them, we have to train them, and we have to provide them all those things uh, to win today's fight. Uh, as well as be the best Air Force we can possibly be in the future, given the resources the American people give us. So uh, those are kind of the three priorities we look at. And the five core functions, and we'll talk about all of them, and again, more than happy to answer any questions, specifically on the individual core functions for the C2, um, it, kind of the each is the JSTARS recap uh, we're working on, and that's moving forward. We're looking at how to move the... Uh, uh, E3 recap somewhere farther left if we can, but inside the top line, that's a difficult challenge for us to do. Uh, and then the AOC weapon systems. Uh, we had a C2 summit as part of WebTAC in January. I had the, uh, all the MAGCOM commanders there, uh, tremendously successful to work the vision of what big C2 looks like in the future, why we take care of all the eaches underneath that, and what kind of what is the AOC of the future and the command and control of theater air power. Uh, in 2025 and 2030, and what steps can we take to work our way there? So, very successful summit, and things went very well. Uh, and we're we're working that vision for the future and how we're going to get there. On the global integrated ISR portion of the core function for us, 25th Air Force stood up. Jack Shanahan's doing fantastic work out there. Uh, we are looking how to. Uh, get the synergy of that NAF and what it can do to pro provide the warfighters everything they need. As everyone well knows, uh, the most uh, in-demand capability uh, for the, or in uh, requirement capability for the Air Force is uh, C2 and ISR and our ability to meet the combatant commander needs in ISR across the spectrum of different, uh, different platforms is a challenge. Jack's working that hard. 
uh, and the way forward on many of those systems and some of the things we're doing is part of the EACHES, but the big picture of ISR for the future and the C2 of ISR is one we're working hard again, and that was part of the C2 summit as well. Uh, global Precision Attack, the, uh, the uh, F-35 program is obviously near and dear to our hearts. Going well, working hard for the IOC. We got some challenges. We're going to do everything in our power to get there. Um, weapons and the advanced weapons that we're, we're looking at for the future and what's going to be part of the uh, portfolio for all our global precision attack platforms and what those look like uh, with respect to uh, sensors and modes uh, that we're going to work on. Those are all things that are uh, heavily involved in, but again, I think the GPA portfolio is one that uh, is, again, heavily in demand, working hard to get there. Uh, air superiority. Uh, uh, Mike Holmes has talked about it, the A58. Uh, we are, um, there's been discussions on FX and, and what's next. Six generations are the names, uh, the things that are talked about out there. The Air Force is kind of going back to the future a little bit and things we used to do a lot and we're a bit better at and we're going to go back to, and that is capability developmental planning. Uh, the, the first one of those uh, capability developmental planning is going to be Air Superiority 2030. Uh, the intent of that is to look across the spectrum, across the domains, uh, take in the lab work that we're having out there, uh, some of the things that are being done by industry, and look at how, uh, given an increasingly threatening uh, potential adversaries out there and their capability, how do we go across domains and do everything within our power uh, to maintain air superiority in 2030 using all domains, all technologies, and all capabilities, and it, the family of systems to provide that air superiority. That's going to kick off here f very soon. And it'll be in a, a CAF, uh, all of us CAF-wise, and then the air staff will work on that. And I think you'll see a lot come out of that. We're going to go to industry a lot to get ideas from them. We're going to take advantage of the labs, and we're going to have a, a, what's called a capability collaboration team, a CCT, to start working uh, the air superiority 2030. And then finally, PR, uh, the CRH is coming along uh, well. I think that uh, the PR, Guardian Angel, uh, and again, hugely in demand uh, capability. We're working hard on those. Um, we're looking at uh, PR in a contested environment as well and what that looks like in the future. And, and that, uh, again, is moving on very well, and, and, and uh, as well as uh, the, the roles across the spectrum uh, in support of PR and CSAR in the future. So. Uh, looking forward to your questions and uh, looking forward to, uh, to anything that we can provide and, and bring the, the crowd into in the discussion. So it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Gork. Thanks, Hawk. Uh, before I get started, I would like to uh, uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, the AFA for all of the work that they do. Um, obviously, I'm a big fan of this organization and, you know, the education that they provide and the advocacy that they give us and certainly the, th the support that they provide for our entire Air Force is greatly appreciated. And, uh, and I know that they're out there every single day describing what it is that the world's greatest Air Force is expected to provide uh, to um, America. and. And, and, you know, in a real way, they help us fill the aspirations of everything that's possible from air. So thanks to the AFA. I, w I was really excited. I was up early this morning because I'm on European time. And, uh, and uh, I was able to uh, watch the first panel. The C2 panel was fantastic. I really enjoyed it, particularly coming off of the... Uh, uh, C2 summit that we just did and so C2 continues to be the core competency that wraps up all of the other capabilities that we provide and you know together with fantastic C2 we're able to exponentially increase the precision and the power and the speed and the flexibility of air so uh, already one hour into it, I feel completely fulfilled after my enjoyable flight in 38 Delta on the way over. Um, the only thing I want to add to Hawk's uh, uh, comments, and first, the other thing, the other people I need to thank is Hawk, because, you know, uh, we're kind of a mixed blend over there in Europe. I, I'm able to benefit from the work that he does on the CAF side and Darren McDo's work he does on the MAF side. Both Lori and I are kind of in that position and obviously they're very gracious about the inputs 
that we make into uh, uh, shepherding calf power or math power. Uh, of course, what I am able to do is provide the view of partner nations and more importantly, our allies. The NATO alliance obviously is increasing in the news lately, given President Putin's antics over there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions on Atlantic Resolve and all of the things that we are doing. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, we're a nation that goes to war in coalitions. Every day we have to develop and nurture relationships because we can't surge relationships, and, and out of those relationships comes trust, and you certainly can surge trust if you haven't done that basic level work. And so in Europe, that's part of the mission, in Europe and Africa, that's part of the mission that we take on board. It's a large task because, you know, between the two AORs, we have 104 countries to work with. That's a large number of countries that have to be accommodated, and they're all very, very interested in what we do. With respect to the mission, um, I don't have a mission statement separate from the one for the United States Air Force because I think it's clear, it's concise, it's distinct. I do have an addendum. For European-based force structure, you know, what we like to say is we're forward, we're ready, and we're ready now. And I think that the recent uh, reaction uh, to the uh, um, lawless actions by President Putin validated that because Quite honestly, we were able to react from go to show in 14 hours and put a significant amount of airplanes forward from those forward locations. And so that's why we talk about being forward, that's why we talk about being ready, and that's why we talk about re uh, being ready now. Uh, the only other things that I want to uh, highlight for you, uh, which, uh, uh, um, which I think are important and, and may inspire some questions, European infrastructure consolidation. After a long effort, uh, all of that information is out and being consumed. I'd be happy to answer questions on that. And then, of course, this new acronym, uh, ERI, European Reassurance Initiative. I can talk about that specifically. We're very, very grateful for those funds because we do believe that we could increase the capability of the alliance and uh, certainly uh, through the O&M, the uh, exercise money that it provides, we'll be able to better elevate the quality of the interoperability and along the way provide an assurance and deterrence uh, that that force can uh, uh, do in, inside of Europe. Um, we, do, uh, we do have permanent base presence, of course. That enables five combatant commanders to do their job without European infrastructure. Five combatant commanders would have a very, very hard time doing their job. Of course, I'm talking about UCOM, I'm talking about AFRICOM, I'm talking about CENTCOM, I'm talking about TRANSCOM, and I'm talking about SOCOM. And so we're about the right size, I'm happy to report. I'm happy to report that our infrastructure pretty much matches our uh, force structure. And like I said, if you have any different points of view on that, I'd be happy to uh, talk about it. The other thing that I want to mention with respect to command and control in particular and CAF capability is the assimilation of emerging threats and emerging requirements. The one that I'm talking about specifically is European phased adaptive approach, the beginning of the process of developing a defense design to handle the emerging threat of um, theater ballistic missiles and the effect that it could have on stability and future uh, war fighting. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to my esteemed colleague. Thank you, esteemed colleague. I, it's been about four months since I've taken command, and uh, I, uh, I have to tell you it's been fast and furious, uh, just as uh, Hawk promised. Uh, I do, I do want to say thanks to Hawk for everything that he's done with the uh, Pacific Air Forces as they've transitioned from a man management level headquarters to a, a combat major command. Uh, the transformation has been amazing and, and the uh, warrior focus uh, that the command has uh, as the air component to uh, PACOM has been amazing and, and it's been fun for, me to, fun for me to watch. You know, one of the things Hawk told me is it's big and you'll be tired and uh, he's not wrong. Uh, I'm tired. Uh, I'm not, I don't know what time I'm on, actually. I'm glad, Gork, you know what time you're on. 
you know, just to give you a sense, and uh, I didn't realize this, but just to give you a sense, it's 52% of the Earth's surface, 83% of that is water, and as Admiral Locklear said uh, at our change of command, 100% of it is covered by air. Uh, it's 36 nations, 16 time zones, and 60% of the world's population. And as everybody's watched uh, out in the news, you can see some of the challenges in the region. You know, the very slow and persistent land reclamation that the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea makes you concerned about the future of access to the global commons. If you look at North Korea uh, and the behavior that's happening there and the disregard for uh, world order uh, by uh, the, the North Koreans, it, it is cause for concern there. And then if you think about, you know, you, we hear an awful lot about uh, Russian activities in uh, uh, Gork's uh, AOR, but I will tell you, the increase in long-range aviation throughout uh, the Pacific region is, uh, is of high concern, and it's things that we watch every day. So when I sit back and I think about those challenges, and the way that those challenges aren't just contained to the peninsula or not just contained to one part, but it's throughout that region. You think about how are you going to be a part of the stability and maintain the stability in the region. And we do that through three things, uh, partnership, presence, and power projection. You know, I had the privilege of representing the chief about a week after uh, the change of command at a Japanese air chiefs conference, and I was be uh, able to begin my partnerships with the uh, nine air chiefs from the region, and it was a great way to start. Uh, at the end of this month, I get to continue the partnerships as I go to Australia for the Australian Air Show. And it's those stability, those things where you reach out and you touch. As Gork mentioned, that it begins today. That trust doesn't just happen in a time of crisis. That trust happens the beginning that you take command and you go out and you visit folks and you see what's happening and what they're doing and you continue those partnerships. Partnerships can be big like that or they can be as significant as many airmen to airmen talks, sitting down airmen to airmen talking about what we do together, whether it's humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, or the opportunity to fly together. You can uh, continue that with presence. One of the things that uh, Hawk started that I think is is really amazing is thinking about things as places, not bases. Where do we need to go? Where are the places that we want to be able to operate from? And what does it look like should we need it in a, in a time of need? Presence isn't just that. Presence is engagements. Last year in FY14, uh, the, the Pacific Airmen did 185 engagements, whether it was as, as uh, significant, small, and, and important uh, as Pacific Angel or all the way up to Red Flag Alaska with multilateral full spectrum training. That kind of presence together is not only the ability to train together, but it sends signals uh, throughout the entire region. And then there's, of course, power projection. Uh, one of the great initiatives that's happening in the theater is uh, an initiative called Rapid Raptor. And that's the ability to take four Raptors, a C-17, uh, and uh, maintainers and capability, and show up someplace, uh, put, uh, put everything down, uh, load up, and power project from whatever place, whether it's Guam or someplace else. And so all it does is send messages that we can pick up, we can go, and we can uh, be a part of anything in the region. We've been able to do the theater security uh, packages since 2004 where we deploy fighter uh, force throughout the region and then continu continuous bomber presence, B-1 and B-52s uh, at Guam since 2004. So all of those things add to stability in the region and it shows our commitment as we have continued our presence and renewed presence uh, in the Pacific region. So finally, what I w also would like to say is thanks to AFA for what you do each and every day for our airmen and their families, and now to the distinguished colleague, <laughs> Sevi Wilson. Well, it's an honor to be here and be on this distinguished panel. Uh, I'd also like to thank AFA for what they do for our airmen and families and, and all your advocacy for throughout, uh, throughout our nation for our Air Force and what we do. If I look back a year ago, I sat on a panel here and I think how much the world has changed in just a year. Okay, a year ago, nobody in this room was talking about Crimea and Ukraine. A year ago, nobody was talking about ISIS and ISIL and the fight there. We weren't talking about Ebola. So I'd say the only constant in our world today is change and the pace of change. And I think we need to think about that as we look forward to the future and what the future holds. One of the things that I think is a distinct U.S. advantage and will continue to be one of those enduring advantages going forward is this globally responsive force that we have, whether it be mobility, ISR, 
or in the world that I pay particular attention to is global strike. And the ability to deploy around the world on, a, on moment's notice and have a ready force that can do their nation's bidding. So we work closely with General Gorence and General Robinson. We have bombers, as, as Lori just mentioned, doing continuous bomber presence in the Pacific and have been doing so for the last 11 years. You know, we've had B-1s in the Middle East since 2001 and they haven't been coming home. And our B-2s regularly deploy both in Europe and to the Pacific. Again, is that vis visible signal uh, and symbol of U.S. strength and power that deters adversaries, whether it be you know, North Korea or whoever, and as well as assuring allies around the globe that we have your back. Well, earlier today, also, I got to sit through the C2 panel and listen to the comments that they have as we move forward with command and control in the, in the 21st century. And it really is two distinct words. It is command. It's a commander, and it's control. And how do I control those forces? And, and what I'm paying particular attention to is how do we do that globally? And how do we stitch that together with regional counterparts, and so whether it be General Robinson or General Gorence and their teams, to provide that globally responsive force with globally assured comms to make sure we can do the mission in whatever denied environment there is out there. Uh, and so we're spending a lot of time and energy thinking our way through that problem set, and, and with that, we have to be able to exercise and train that way. General Carlisle just brought us all together at Nellis for the C2 Summit. It was a great opportunity to talk to some warfighters and see how we, how we move C2 forward because it is truly foundational to everything we do in our, in our Air Force. I'm also thinking about that and how do we do that in nuclear command and control because we'll have to nest that inside big C2 bubble. Uh, and so it's an exciting time to be in our Air Force. We got lots of challenges around the world, uh, but I can tell you that the, the airmen that, that I get to hang out with are ready uh, to do our nation's business. So let me stop talking. I know uh, Scott's got questions over there. We'll be had, uh, glad to answer them. Well, thank you all very much. Now, each of your commands uh, was hit by different degrees of, uh, uh, of impact by sequestration in 2013. Uh, as we face the possibility of sequestration in 2016, uh, how are you going to approach this differently? How are you going to prepare for it? And how are you going to deal with it, and do you have any confidence whatsoever that Congress will come across and save the day? <laughs> That's an easy question. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, I, I think one of the biggest challenge, uh, and I was in Lori's seat at the time, and in fact, I think uh, as it should be, both Europe and PACAF were the ones that were most protected with respect to sequestration. ACC and what Mike Hostage had to do was actually the hardest challenge. Um, the, the, cha the big challenge in 13 was we, we, were, um, we didn't start until halfway through the year. Uh, and we spent in the first half as if sequestration wasn't going to happen. So the challenge was we had to take the full year's cut in half the year. And oh, by the way, there was uh, money that was non-discretionary or contract or bylaw we couldn't touch to include personnel and contracts and other things. So the pool from which we could take money was very small. And the result was we had to take a big hit. Uh, you know, the, the, they talked 10 or 20 percent. It actually ended up being 50 percent of our O&M and things like that. We grounded fighter squadrons, which was uh, terrible, uh, put us into a deeper readiness hole. And again, what Mike was forced to do was make sure that the folks who were going downrange were the most prepared, capable, and equipped they could possibly be. I think what we've done this year, and, and uh, the leadership of the Air Force, Secretary James General Welsh, obviously it is we are anticipating it. Uh, we, are, we are making the tough calls early, so we start the year understanding. Uh, we, the President's budget is above BCA level, um, but within the Air Force we have looked at, uh, if law does not change, what if we have the decision uh, ability, which in, it, once it gets to Congress, it, it's Congress's decision on, on where we make those cuts. Um, so it, it's, uh, we're better prepared. We're going into it uh, uh, realizing that it could very possibly happen um, and that we're, if we have a choice and when, when the leadership and all of us spend time up on Capitol Hill, we tell them what we, if we have to cut back to BCA level, uh, what we would do. So we're starting off in a better position. Having said that, um, and I think universally Secretary James General Welsh and everyone here has said this, if we live through uh, BCA level budgets, through the fight up into the next decade, 
we will fundamentally be a different Air Force than we are today. We will not be able to do what we do today because there simply will not be enough uh, total obligation authority to get there. So uh, we just uh, go back to what we're all trying to do, and that is we have to produce the very best Air Force we can given the resources the American people give us. And, and that will be the, the decisions of what to cut. And it's come through in many different events and, and many different discussions on the decisions we made on what to cut. They were not decisions we wanted to make, but given the resources we had to make. And that's where we ended up where we're at today. So, and whether with respect to confidence in uh, Congress uh, changing the law, my most recent time on the Hill, which was about two weeks ago, and, and Secretary James General Welsh have a better feeling for this, but uh, in, within the uh, Armed Services Committee, both the HASC and SASC, I think there's realization what BCA level budgets would do to us. Uh, sadly, outside of those two committees, it's not being talked about very much, uh, which to me says it's probably, um, I, I don't have uh, a lot of positive uh, of, that will be released from BCA level budgets. So, Gork, would you like to respond? I like when people ask me congressional questions on a panel and I'm sitting between two former LLs. <laughs> I'll defer that kind of, I'll defer the answer to that question. I do want to just highlight though, uh, the one thing that we did learn about operating in a sequestered environment, you know, 13 was a pretty important year for us because it, 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 it forced us to really look into the effects of not flying airplanes on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, all of the the models with respect to if you have a squadron that sits down for a month, it takes an exponential amount of time to get back to that level of readiness. And I think that, you know, we really need to, you know, prepare the battlefield and describe what the effect of any sequestered budget and a long standing, you know, uh, 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 having a squadron sit on the ground. So that's really the only thing I wanted to mention because in the end, what we said was exactly what kind of came to fruition with respect to recovering uh, from those sequestered budgets. I do think it solidified our commitment to the flying hour program and the weapon system support necessary uh, to do the work. And so uh, between us and the CAF, I think that there's a solidified view of, of what in fact we would do if, in, if we got into that situation again, because the corrosive effect of having squadrons sit around and not fly airplanes cannot be understated because it affects the airplanes, it affects the people, it affects the training, and does long-term damage to our Air Force. I'd like to add uh, uh, to what Gork said about, the, I agree with him what he said about the flying part, so I won't comment on that because, you know, I was able when sitting at Air Combat Command during that to watch that corrosive effect and watch the, the planning and the replanning. Uh, so I won't add to that, but what I will add to, uh, as Hawk said, we, uh, the Pacific Air Forces were relatively untouched, but one of the things that, that we did pay a price in, and that was partnerships. Uh, when we had to uh, cancel exercises and cancel TDYs and cancel uh, those things that we talked about, that I talked about earlier as we reach out and touch and build trust and confidence in relationships, when you, when you touch that and when you break that, that is a concern for a long-term commitment and trust and confidence with your friends and allies. And so if we've learned anything, it's out now, what are we going to do to prioritize our friendships and, and what are we going to do to prioritize our TDYs uh, should we have a sequestered budget and, and how do we maintain that trust and confidence throughout the region uh, should, should the sequestered budget come back. Uh, that's probably the place where I get most concerned uh, because that trust and confidence is something that we need each and every day. Uh, as we uh, are the stability in the region. Uh, and I will have to agree with Hawk, uh, having uh, uh, been on the Hill recently, uh, but more importantly, watching the sequestration hearing, uh, but not seeing much talked about after that, uh, not seeing much talked about uh, at all uh, from anybody, I have huge concerns uh, on whether or not uh, sequestration will go away. I'll pick up a tangible example of what General Robinson just talked about. So in the spring of 2013, we flew a deterrence and assurance sortie with a B-2 from Whiteman Air Force Base to South Korea and back. And it was a 38-hour sortie. 
It involved, involved five different refuelings, 10 different tankers, uh, AWACS, and an immense amount of coordination between uh, from, the, from the White House to, to the Pentagon, through all the different air operations centers to, uh, along the way. And after that sequestration hit, and we canceled every overseas training exercise involving bombers for the next year. So there were air crews that didn't get that opportunity to do that. On the, on the South Korea deter and assure sortie, uh, no one was shooting back at us. So I told the chief at the time that I said, if we have to do this again and someone's shooting back, and I've got a B-52 air crew, and he hasn't had an air refueling in 90 days. Uh, and he may be current, but he's not proficient. And he's over the middle of the Pacific in the middle of the night in bad weather, and I'm counting on him to do his mission. We've got a lot of risk. So that's, that's a tangible impact of what sequestration did to our Air Force. And there's lots more. You know, when we cancel a weapons school class, we can't get that back. Right? There's 100 people that would have graduated from a weapons school class that our Air Force doesn't have now. Um, th those are things that, that do great harm to our nation, and we cannot afford that as we go forward with, it, with any type of uh, future budget. And we're going to have to prioritize what's important, but when we have impacts like that, that, that has a really big impact on our Air Force and a long-term impact. Thanks. Uh, General Garantz, I'll uh, pass this one on to you. You raised the issue of infrastructure consolidation in Europe, and uh, you and I were earlier talking about uh, force structure levels in Europe as well. Would, in light of the activities in Ukraine and, and that neck of the woods, would you talk about uh, force structure levels? Are you sufficient? Do we have enough deterrence in Europe uh, today uh, to cause folks to consider what they're doing? Um, I mean, I'm comfortable with, with, uh, with what we have. I mean, clearly, Many of these decisions were made well prior to the resurgence of Russia, and uh, and so um, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. And you know, I think at this kind of this kind of discussion always ends up with uh, a fundamental uh, understanding that in the end uh, we have force structure available in Europe to be forward ready and now. It's full it's full spectrum. It's well trained, but the fact of the matter is, is if I had a situation in Europe, Africa, or any other place that you know requires European infrastructure, I I have an entire expeditionary air force to reach back to and make requests for capability, and I'm not uncomfortable with rotational forces. We've been operating that way for a long time. I'm confident in anything that Hawk would be able to provide. You know, but the question is, for the worldwide situation, where would the priority lie? And you know, on any given day, I don't know exactly you know, what, what the situation's gonna be in the world. I love what Seve described as you know, where we were last year versus where we were this year, and uh, the three things that popped up on the radar scope that nobody affected, however, each one of them required air power to respond in a, in a very precise way and in a fast way. And so um, I guess the answer to your question is I'm comfortable with the forward presence in Europe. Do I want more? Of course I want more. But the fact of the matter is, is you know, we're an Air Force that's been making some key decisions on where we're going to have uh, forward presence and where we're going to supplement with rotational force. The good thing about European infrastructure consolidation, those commanders previous to me and myself when I got in Europe, we always used to carry the mantra, um, if you want to reduce in Europe, it's infrastructure, not force structure. We worked very closely with OSD on the project of European infrastructure. The decisions we made with European infrastructure consolidation, we were fully involved with it. We made our case. Quite honestly, I didn't have to make a case for a lot of the infrastructure. It made uh, other combatant commanders were in there describing what they needed in Europe. And so for the first time in a long time, once the decisions of European infrastructure consolidation are completely implemented, I can honestly say we have a good balance between infrastructure and force structure. And what I want everybody to know is the discussion about uh, forward basing, particularly in Europe, to me, uh, should be over. Because the, re the reality is, is that since the fall of the Berlin Wall 
Europe in every category with respect to the Air Force is downsized by a full 75 percent. In order to do the building partnership capacity that is resident and inherent in the American way of war, both the infrastructure and the force structure are nicely sized. If we go below that, there's going to be risk to that. If, uh, and certainly, I always want to go above it. But the other thing is, um, for the first time ever, we actually got a TSP package in Europe. <laughs> there are 12 A-10s right now in Europe flying out of Spangdalem for a six-month period. And for that, I'm grateful. I have plenty of work for them to do. And it'll just reinforce to the Europeans that when we need to elevate our training, when we need capability to continue to build partnerships and foster interoperability, the Air Force will respond. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, General Carlisle, the F-22 has been flying in uh, uh, combat here for a few months. Are there any surprises, any lessons learned that have come from its initial uh, uh, implementation? Um, I, I don't know if I'd call it surprises. It's been, it, it, I, th I think across the spectrum, people would say that it's even exceeded our expectations. Uh, the airplane has performed fantastically. And what we have discovered with its ability to go to areas where other aircraft maybe can't, its ability to, uh, to, to re-roll and to mission manage the entire force, uh, what we've discovered, uh, which I think we knew, but it has reinforced, is the fact that when you have F-22s in a, in a package, every single airplane in that package is better because the F-22s are there. And uh, whether it's their uh, strike, uh, whether it's their escort, whether it's their uh, ability to manage the, the force and to do re-rolls real time in the middle of the fight, uh, to do dynamic targeting, all of those things are, are just re-emphasized. And, and any, uh, if you talk Kit Hesterman over there, he'll tell you that we're putting Raptors into every package uh, whenever we can, and it is most of the time, because they have, uh, they've exceeded even what we expected with making the whole the entire package a better package. Excellent, thanks. Uh, for Yusefi and, uh, and PACAF, I guess both, uh, can you talk about any uh, challenges you have with intel and information sharing with allies and coalition partners, especially based on our own classification procedures and policies? Um, the answer for me is uh, of course. I mean, I think that the, the, the person that asked that question knows there's a challenge with that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and it's an ongoing challenge. It's one that we continue to work. Sometimes urgency helps in, um, you know, the ability to share data. But I think there's fundamentally two issues when it comes to intel sharing. First of all, there's policy, you know, and I'm not the policy guy you know, except for, you know, the inputs that I can make with respect to what is the coalition of the willing, when are we going to transition to NATO, all of those kinds of things. And then, of course, uh, there's the technical challenges with intel sharing. Some of those challenges, you know, involve the ability to move data uh, in, from machine to machine. And so uh, uh, I, I just want to underscore that, you know, both of those are unique and distinct problems. You know, there's policy issues, uh, you know, at the political level, there's policy issues with the technical ability to do that and to, and to um, um, share that data. But the bottom line is for us, and every, every day we're trying to enforce standards to uh, keep the capability of moving uh, information uh, from machine to machine. Without the ability to move that information machine to machine in today's environment and to do the command and control necessarily, necessary, you will significantly decrease the effectiveness of the coalition. <clears throat> I'm with Gork. Who, whoever asked knows that there's a, there's a problem. I would tell you that we have some capability and capacity to do some intel sharing, but, but 
the place where I want to go is why is it important? Why is it important to share intel? Is it to, important just so you're sharing that information? I would contend the importance of sharing intel is again that building of trust and confidence and the understanding that we are going to work together and we're here to help wherever and whenever uh, needed. That trust and confidence that you can do day to day when your ability to share things with your coalition partners, your allied partners, uh, underpins everything that's going to happen should something happen in a time of crisis and can will build that trust and confidence. So when I talk about it and the need uh, for more capacity and capability, it's not just so I get more information, but it's more to continue to build on uh, that partnership and relationship so the trust and confidence keeps going up. Thank you very much. Uh, General Wilson, uh, in light of the uh, 16 budget. Uh, what's your feeling about how serious DOD is about about uh, concern modernizing the land-based leg of the triad? Do you think we're going to be are we, are we on the right track? Are we uh, keeping up with the Russians who are modernizing their forces? And is a, uh, a three-star the uh, appropriate level of command for a global strike command? <laughs> <laughs> Good, luck. Yeah. Good luck with that one, right? Well, let me start with a couple of them. So, um, you know, last year we had a bunch of reviews, uh, again reviews. So we had the uh, Creed Infanta report, we had the Welsh Harbor report. And they all underscored uh, a couple of things, that we'd, we'd lost some focus uh, throughout the nuclear enterprise, uh, and we hadn't sustained the commitment that we needed to. And so uh, Secretary of Defense Hagel and Deputy uh, Secretary of Work, as well as the Secretary and the Chief, have been uh, very... Uh, powerful influences to ensure that the, the resources were flowed appropriately to the nuclear enterprise. So uh, at Secretary uh, Hagel's press conference a few weeks back, he talked about a 10% year-over-year increase. And so we're seeing a little bit of that in the 16 budget um, coming to the nuclear enterprise. And, and certainly we have lots of things, a prioritized list to be able to do that. But I'd also say lots of that money is in uh, the presidential budget, and if there's a sequestered budget, there's going to be some real challenges because they won't get funded. Uh, and I, I think it's absolutely mandatory that we do that. Most people don't uh, really think much about our ICBM leg of the triad, but the missiles were actually designed in the 50s. The first holes were dug at our bases at Malmstrom was wing one in the early 60s, and the Minuteman one went on, on alert in 1962. The Minuteman III that we currently have has been on alert since the mid-60s. Today, the lower stage of the missile is still a Minuteman I missile. So we've got an old missile. It's been, we're doing all the service life extensions on it, but those missiles are foundational to our national security. If, if you look, they, they are the thing that are gonna prevent any out of the blue attack against the United States because they, they raise the ante and make another nation say, you know, I just can't do that. Uh, and they're relatively inexpensive in the big scheme of things. So we're committed to go forward with this ground-based strategic deterrent. Uh, we're, we've gone through the analysis of alternatives. We're working with the OSD and folks to, to bring forward an integrated capability uh, in about 2030. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> General Carlisle, of course, the Air Force was trying to divest itself of the A-10 in order to do a number of things save money and free up maintenance personnel for the IOC or the F-35 if the A-10 in fact is not allowed to be uh, retired how are you going to handle the maintenance issues and find the find the personnel you need for that uh, that IOC? Uh, tremendous challenge uh, I think that the discussion has to actually go beyond that so the I think we and we had a discussion the chief and the secretary uh, yesterday reference uh, how to get to IOC at Hill for the IOC requirements, number of aircraft, and the capabilities. Um, there's a couple of ways that we're looking at potentially doing that, and I think most folks are aware of that. We're looking at, pot at potentially at one of the FTU bases, uh, Luke, of doing contract maintenance to some extent. We're looking at other uh, having to potentially uh, uh, take down some squadrons earlier in, in, that are going to transition, but transition them earlier. Um, all of those things are a short-term fix. The, the challenge that I see, I believe, and I know the Secretary-in-Chief do as well, uh, we got some challenges ahead of us, but I believe we'll get to IOC. I think we'll be able to get to that requirement. 
but it just grows after that. So my, my challenge is uh, I think we have a way forward to get to an IOC in 16 sometime between August and December, uh, but that's just the beginning. And then we're going to be producing airplanes and buying airplanes at a fairly high rate, and we're not going to buy them and park them. Uh, we have to grow that maintenance capability, and it grows uh, you know, it's 300 or so in the early time, but it grows to 2,000 folks as you get out towards the end of the fight up. So we have got to figure out how to, because the Air Force isn't getting any bigger, so we have got to figure out how to retire some aircraft and replace them with F-35s, and the maintenance manpower uh, is a key component of that. And so as we work our way through the fight up, uh, we have got to not just worry about AOC, IOC, but we've got to worry about what happens after that and where we're going. And, and it, it is a challenge if we can't retire aircraft. I wonder if we could talk about the <clears throat> campaign against ISIS, ISIL, whatever we want to call them. I'm not even sure why we can't come up with a single name for who the bad guys are. Um, but up until recently, when the Jordanian pilot was, was killed, uh, the level of... Um, information, the, the level of effort appeared to be fairly um, low compared to what we've seen in the past when we create air campaigns against a, a threat. Can you talk about the level of effort and is it a matter of uh, not being able to find targets? Uh, is it a matter of the coalition partners? Uh, what are the things that influence the level of effort that are going in into ISIS? Um, again, a great question, and, and we'll stay away from operational details because obviously that's something you don't talk about in no open forum. But what I will say, one thing that's incredibly frustrating to me is air power is not working. And, and you hear the, a lot of uh, media in particular talk about that, and a lot of people that don't understand uh, talk about that. And in fact, air power is doing fantastic, and the folks over there are doing tremendous work. And some of the things we've done, uh, their ability to finance uh, has been severely, severely uh, basically cut off because of some things we've done to take out their ability to use black market oil and their uh, refi refining capability. Their ability to mass with any numbers, their ability to communicate and control what's going on. Uh, has been uh, degraded uh, significantly. We've taken back Kobani. Uh, we're holding Missoul. Uh, we're going to probably go back in into Missoul and Baji and all of those. So air power is actually being very effective. Um, but and we've changed the way they can operate. They again, they can't mass. They can't control their forces. People talk about the influx of, of fighters, which is a huge challenge, but then what you do with them when you can't mass numbers and you can't command and control them. So uh, it is being effective. I, th I think that it's a different fight, and I, you know, I think that's the other thing is this, it, it, comparing it to what we did in Iraqi freedom or Desert Storm or uh, uh, Enduring Freedom, it, this is a different fight, and it, we just got to acknowledge that, and the way we're going about it and what uh, General Austin and General Hesterman are doing over there uh, is in General Terry as the um, Joint Task Force Commander. It, it's being successful. Now, um, we've got a lot more work to do. Uh, we, have, uh, we have to uh, find a way forward, and I think is, is a, a big part of it, not just the actual fight, but what the GCC and how they, how they approach it. It's an existential threat to their countries, and they have to acknowledge that, and then, and then as they continue on, um, what they're going to do uh, to continue to hold ground and continue to, to win that fight. So um, it is a different fight. I think comparing it to the previous ones is because it is significantly different. Uh, I think we have had, air power has had tremendous effect. Uh, and what is being accomplished over there by the air component uh, has been very successful. And it's, uh, it's continuing at a pace uh, that is that is getting the job done in, de in uh, severely degrading, uh, stopping and severely degrading uh, the, the force out there. Uh, I think on behalf of Lori and I, the one thing that I want uh, to highlight with respect to ISIS, I'm not on, you know, obviously it's not my theater, it's not, it's not Lori's, but take a look at who's there with us, you know, because it reinforces you know, the work that we do worldwide, because when things happen, there are people that choose to go with us, and, uh, and, and that interoperability 
the ability to switch on and operate in a coalition way from day one is something that has to be brought out as a topic of goodness at every opportunity. And, and that's why forward-based work is so important because every time we turn around and we are pursuing the aspirations of the United States, the same cast of characters are there and they're operating in an interoperable way from day one. Thank you, and this will be for everybody. Uh, please share your perspectives about the rising cyber challenges in command and control in particular. Uh, certainly is in the news today because mostly of civilian uh, problems, but uh, what keeps you up regarding cyber? Everything. <laughs> My banking account is what I'm worried about. Um, I, I think uh, I th cyber is, uh, obviously it's growing, it's a man-main domain. Uh, I think uh, the military portion of that is just a portion of it. There's a, a huge uh, domestic and, and uh, the civilian uh, approach to cyber in defending the United States in ways that are some a lot inside the military, some are not inside the military. And if you look at what uh, Admiral Mike Rogers is doing and what NSA does and Cybercom does, that 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 is a and what the United States government does reference to cyber. So I th I think it's broader uh, and it's a it's a huge challenge for the entire country. Uh, militarily, I think exactly what you mentioned. Um, we need to be able to control theater air power wherever and whenever our nation asks us to do it. We have to have agile, flexible, resilient command and control, information control, the ability to pass information, the ability to collect and disseminate intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance information, uh, and control the forces. So how we get to that and how we build that, a, a large portion of the C2 Summit talked about how we get that agile, flexible, uh, resilient command and control to control theater air power across the spectrum. So, uh, we, uh, you know, I, 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 we have um, folks like John Hyten out there, it, it, brilliant uh, commander of uh, Air Force Space Command, talks about fighting SATCOM. That's something that wasn't talked about before, but how do you fight SATCOM to get the bandwidth and the information where you want it, when you want it, and when you need to do it? And, and there's a way to do that, and we just have to get after that. Uh, how you build uh, is... is uh, centralized command, decentralized execution, the basic tenet of control of air power, how do you uh, take advantage of distributed? How do you ha have uh, a flexible, ag flexible and agile command and control system that can respond to uh, deception, denial uh, of C2 nodes, and how do you take advantage of that? Those are all the things we're working on, and that's all part of the, the C2 summit. But I, I think... Um, Ultimately, it's a, it's a national problem, and militarily, we're working on our part of it uh, uh, very hard. But, but what keeps me up at night is that uh, command and control of theater air power to accomplish the mission in any theater we're asked to operate in across the world. Um, so I guess what I would tell you that keeps me up uh, at night, uh, reference command and control, is, as uh, Hawk just said, assured comms. But when I think about assured comms, you know, we always talk about, you know, we'll either have comms or we won't have comms. What I worry about is the degradation of communications and our ability to detect that and understand that. I get concerned sometimes that we might think we're transmitting and people are receiving, uh, but that might not be happening. It's easy to tell when you have communications and it's easy to tell when you don't have communications, but it's very difficult to understand the degradation of those communications. And then as I think in the Pacific theater with the vast distances and the, and the need to be able to command and control for Forces throughout the theater is now what if as we're understanding the degradation of the communications what is our ability uh, to continue operations should we need to and how do we do that do you do it forward or do you do it with reach back and where do you do it if you do it forward and where do you do it if you do it reach back so those are the two things that I think through as I think about theater command and control and the ability uh, to command and control air power is understanding degradation and understanding uh, continuation of operations I agree with everything that's just been said I think the other part is assured data and making sure that we can that we can count on it um, and then how do, how do we move forward? I think this will be part of this third offset that people talk about in terms of our command and control and our ability to, to integrate, 
cyberspace and kinetics across the spectrum to our advantage and not be influenced by adversaries who are going to try and do the exact opposite to us. So there's, there's certainly an offense-defense mix here, but, but that assured calm and the ability to, to connect all the different stovepipes between cyberspace and kinetic I think will be really important moving forward. Yeah, and I, I agree with everything that's been said here. I, I, I will take it down a notch a little bit because one of the things that I think is interesting about this domain is the integration of cyber effects and kinetic effects and the relationship between them. You know, we're very good on the kinetic side of, of predicting what the result will be. Uh, we're less sure exactly of, of what will happen with respect to the cyber effect, how long, how effective, you know, what branches and sequels need to be developed in order to integrate cyber and non, you know, and kinetic effects. The problem with it is right now the ability to predict what will happen creates so many branches and sequels and, or could create so many branches and sequels that it will exceed the capacity of the AOC to actually do the work, particularly if it's, if it's a high-speed conflict or a fast-moving conflict. Well, thank you all very much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I thank you very much for your participation.